We're in James 4. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17. And let me tell you, it's not a nice passage. Okay, we started out by saying that. Just so you're prepared, because what James is going to do here is he's going to be bringing a word of rebuke, and you'll see it in a moment. And so what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to just prepare us for his words, because uh, it's a word of rebuke that he's bringing to to those who are business people, they're, they're wealthy and, and all. And he's going to be speaking to the wealthy in a way that is, uh, we may say, well, it's not something that we as, as uh, just a- average people really need to be worried about because we're not really wealthy. And I think that we need to remember that there are principles we find in Scripture that are general principles for all of us. And you may not be a multi-billionaire, multi-millionaire or whatever, but... Uh, there is a, a, a sense that uh, the finances that we have and the plans that we make are still in the hands of the Lord. And we may not be a multimillionaire, but we are much, much more blessed than sometimes we even realize. And so there are things here that we can, uh, that we can <laughs> apply to our own lives. And, and that's what I'm going to try and do today. I'm going to look at these verses. I'm going to take you back over some of the things you've already seen, because I want to highlight the importance of unity, because we've been looking in chapter 4 at division, then you saw that in verse 1, and I've been touching that for the last couple of studies, and that does lead into verse 13. So I want to remind you of a few things as we begin our study, then we're going to move into verse 13, and we'll go to verse 17, and uh, that's how we'll look at this passage today. So prepare yourself for the study. Realize that there is a lot of foundations I want to lay And then we'll get to the word, its application, and then we'll close. So I'll begin reading here at verse 13, James chapter 4. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead... You ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So up until this point, as mentioned a moment ago, James has been dealing with division in uh, the churches that he's writing to. What is happening is the problems that they're encountering in the churches are undermining the unity of the fellowship. And when unity is disrupted, the church is not going to be able to fulfill its mission. The church has a mission that we have, and when the unity is is disrupted, then that mission, and we'll look at that in a moment, is going to be disrupted. We're not going to be able to fulfill it to the way that, that God would intend. Now, when you look at your Bible, there are those today that will wonder why unity is so important. Because I think sometimes when you use the word unity, uh, the people may misunderstand that word unity and, and actually substitute the word uniformity. Unity and uniformity are not the same thing, obviously. Uniformity speaks of, of people who are, um, are basically just doing the same thing that other people are doing. They're uniform in their activities, but it's more of an outward kind of thing. And, and when you have just uniformity, that's really, that's really the foundation, if you will, for a cult, uh, because cults very often are, are built on everybody looking the same, acting the same, saying the same thing. And uh, the Bible doesn't teach us to have uniformity so much as the Bible encourages us to have unity. And when you look at the Bible, there are reasons for it. I mean, there are reasons why God says that we're to be one, that we're to be one in the spirit, that we're to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There are are reasons for that. Uh, And let me give you three as I introduce this, three basic reasons why unity is important. One, unity is important just in the fact that Jesus Christ prayed that we would have it. Jesus prayed that the church would have unity in, in John, in chapter 17, verse 20, uh, Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And then he goes on in his prayer to say that they all may be one, 
as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So he says, first, I'm praying that they may be one. So unity is important, a unity of heart and spirit and endeavoring to move forward in the things of the Lord together is very important because Jesus prayed for it. And secondly, unity is a powerful witness to an unbelieving world. In a world that doesn't think that working together necessarily is that important, where every man for himself is kind of the attitude that many have, unity is important because it declares something to the unbelieving world. You see, it's been said a unified church is one of the strongest evidences of the truth of the gospel. Jesus, again, in the same prayer in John 17, verse 21, said this. He said that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us. Then he goes on to say that the world may believe that you sent me. And so one, Jesus prayed for unity, and two, the purpose of that prayer is so that the world would believe that we may be one in him, that the world may be one through him. And so that's the second reason. One, he wants us to to uh, live in unity, therefore prayed for it too. The unbelieving world can be impacted by a unified church. It's very important that we as the church are having unity. Our mutual faith in Jesus is uh, what has been referred to as the communion of the saints. And we need to remember that the Holy Spirit baptized us into the one body, the one body of Christ. And, And because of that, we have all been made to drink that one spirit and we work together. Again, There are different ways to do what God called us to do. Not all of us uh, subscribe to the same outward kinds of appearances in terms of how we do what we do. But in essence, we are one. And we're to be one in the essentials. I'll show you some of the essentials in just a moment. But there's another reason for us to be uh, united, and that is because we have a common enemy. Satan's strategy, as revealed in Scripture, is very clear. It is to to divide us, because in dividing us, he renders us ineffective. In Mark chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, Jesus said, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And so Jesus prayed that we would be unified. It is a witness to the world that the world may be one, And we are united against the enemy who would divide us and undermine the work and its effectiveness. You see, the church stands united in opposition to him. And the church stands united in the face of persecution, which he very often foments. So we have to be aware of the schemes of the enemy. And we have to understand that the enemy has a way of attempting to undermine our unity. We're seeing that here in the book of James. And that's why James in chapter 4 began by saying, where do wars and fights come from among you? And went on to say it came from within yourself. He's saying that this this unity, this disunity that you're experiencing is really undermining the things that God has called you to do. Now, this doesn't mean, again, that we're uniform in everything. It doesn't mean that we agree on everything. There are those who believe that the rapture, which is uh, me, and I would say most of us in this church, The rapture is going to occur. It's the next thing on the prophetic calendar. It's going to happen at any moment. There are others who say, no, the rapture is going to occur at the end of the tribulation or in the middle of the tribulation. And, you know, and when we're in heaven, they'll explain to me how wrong they were. But a person can believe that the rapture occurs as I do. I believe the Bible is very clear about this. It's going to occur before the tribulation. And no, I'm not teaching on that right now, but the Bible is clear about that. But somebody says, no, I don't agree with that. Well, we're still united in our common faith of of Jesus Christ. That person is still my brother or sister in the Lord. We have a difference. But if that person says Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh, that person isn't saved. In order to be saved, You believe that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity. That is an essential of the faith. So the essentials are important. Those things that are not essential are things that we work in charity with, a person who has a different kind of view of that. In 1627, 
a German theologian who, who called himself Rupertus Maldinius coined the phrase, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. And that's how we ought to live. And so the unity of the Spirit is what we, we strive to have. Now, I mentioned a moment ago, and I'm going to give you this. This is all introductory to the passage we're going to look at in a moment. But you might be asking yourself, well, what are these essentials that you're speaking about? Because there are things that are of great import for us to, to hold fast to. Well, these are some of the essentials. Let me share with you things that are important that we hold fast to. We hold fast to the inerrancy and inspiration of the Scripture. We hold fast to the virgin birth and deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We hold fast to the doctrine of substitutionary atonement and salvation through grace and, and faith. We hold fast to the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. We hold fast to the fact that Jesus performed miracles. And we hold fast to his soon return, his second coming. These are essentials. These are things that you find in Scripture that are important, that the Word of God is the very Word of God, that, that Mary was a virgin, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that Jesus died on a cross for us as a substitute, and that by His grace through faith we're saved. We believe that Jesus Christ was not just a good teacher or a, a wonderful prophet, uh, an excellent man, but that He's God in the flesh who died on a cross, was buried, and we believe that He was resurrected the third day. That's an essential. We believe that Jesus Christ walked the earth and he performed miracles and we look forward to his soon return, that Jesus Christ is coming again for us. We believe that. Now, somebody has been posting and others have been picking it up and reposting it and all, and it said, Santa's not coming to town, but Jesus is. And I kind of like that because it's true. You know, Santa ain't coming, but Jesus is. And so that is something that we as believers hold firmly to. Those are essentials of the faith especially the things that pertain to Christ, his death on a cross, his burial, his resurrection, the third day, his physical bodily resurrection. Those things are important. His ascension into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He sends the Holy Spirit to, to indwell those who believe in him. One day he'll come and draw us to himself, take us to be with him. These are all things that are essentials. These are things that we agree on, and those are the things that make for unity. So James is correcting them. James is correcting them because they've fallen into the trap of division. And he has already said this, we've seen this, that envy and strife have become commonplace and that those sins of envy and strife have, have given way to and produced gossip. And so there's gossip, and he was speaking about that as we'd gone through chapter 4. He said it's become commonplace there. They're speaking evil of one another. And gossip is destructive because it undermines the love of the Holy Spirit in the church. We need to remember that believers are to be known by love, a love that is lived out in harmony, and again, it's a witness to the unbelieving world. It's interesting when you begin to note what the book of Proverbs teaches concerning uh, uh, gossip and division and all. It's interesting when you read chapter 6 of the book of Proverbs, because in chapter 6 of the book of Proverbs, uh, that chapter speaks of things that God hates. It even says these are things that God hates. And... Uh, it begins by saying there are six, these six things, uh, yea, these seven are things that God hates. And he says in Proverbs 6, verse 19, that God hates a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. So James, when he's saying, where do wars and fights come from among you, is simply repeating what Scripture teaches, that unity is something Jesus prayed for, it's a witness to the world, and it's a way of fighting against the enemy who's always trying to divide. So instead of speaking evil, the body of Christ is to preserve peace in the Spirit of God. And it's something that I am to do. I endeavor to do that. It's my personal responsibility. It's something I should be seeking to do. Ephesians 4 says it like this. I therefore, verses 1 through 3, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So Christians are commanded to pursue peace and the unity of the Spirit. We're to endeavor. That word endeavor means to intensely labor. We're to endeavor to keep or to preserve unity and peace. 
Unity of the Spirit speaks of the unity of our sentiments, our desires, our affections. The bond of peace speaks of uh, where the interests of all parties are held together by the Holy Spirit. So gossip and slander destroys the unity and the peace of the Spirit. Like it says in Proverbs 11:13, a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals the matter. So a faithful friend doesn't spread secrets, but lovingly protects the person's reputation. And so we've been going through chapter 4, and we concluded by remembering that only God can see the heart, and therefore only God knows all the details. We have a tendency of judging on outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so James is concluding chapter 4 by building on the theme of dependence, depending on God. And so that's going to continue the exhortation to the worldly people who are there in the churches. And he's addressing those who are abandoned to pleasure, as well as those who are seeking self-centered success. So this chapter, verses 13, chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, well, this portion reveals the way people generally make plans. Too often, there's no thought of God, no thought of His Spirit's leading, and no thought of what is the ultimate best. Men, many simply plan out their lives as if God doesn't exist or that God is not involved. And so his exhortation here that we'll be looking at now is a simple one. Do not make plans without praying. Our, our plans should be prayerfully made, and our plans should be committed to the directions of the Lord. He begins at verse 13 this way, chapter 4. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. So... This is a call to rich business people. He's already been making statements to those who are rich in the church and the preferential treatment that sometimes rich people were receiving. So he's already been speaking to uh, uh, riches and uh, those who are rich. But this is a uh, specific call to those who are rich business owners. But it also applies to any materialist. The ones being addressed are those who have no place for God in their plans. Now, when you look at verse 13, you might not notice this at first glance, but let me show you this. And again, I'm still developing a foundation for you. Look at verse 13. I want to show you something there. He says, come now. So you know he's dressing them, drawing them to himself. You who say, so he tells us who he's speaking to. You who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. This is how he's beginning this section. It's a call to rich business owners. And as he's speaking, what I'm going to show you right now is something that is well known by those in this church right now who may own businesses. You'll understand this because what he's giving to them is he's actually giving to them a plan of operation. He has a start time, today or tomorrow. He has a demographic we will go to such and such a city. They have a timeline. We'll spend a year there. They have a business strategy. We will buy and sell. They have a goal. We will make a profit. If you're a business owner, you know these things. If you never went to economics, if you never went to a school that taught you how to plant a business, you know these things. You know these things. You know about start times, demographics, set timelines. You know, you know business strategy. You know goals. Those are something you're taught. You might find this interesting. I won't belabor this, but this is something that every person who starts something, even a church, would understand. I understand this. I understand this because a church is an organized organism. So there's organization within this church. So I have a lot of fellowship that I can have with business people because in general, we do very similar, similar things. There is a, a start time. So what did we do as a church, for example? We prayed, Father, we want to be, it's a start time. We're going to begin our first Sunday, July 26, 1981. There was a start time. And then you have your demographics. You know, who do we want to reach? These are all things that you have. Now, I get every week on Facebook, every week, I get invitations to attend seminars 
to teach me how to plant a church and build a church. Every week, I get these. And it's always these younger guys with giant beards now. They go all the way down to their chest. And, and you know, they're cool and suave. And, and they're walking, and they always have, you know, selfie moments where they're saying, hey, you want, I'd like to help you to build your church. And I'm looking at this guy, and I'm thinking, how interesting, you know, why? It's because he's going to make money. And he'll tell you. We'll, we'll tell you how to determine when. And we'll tell you how. And we can guarantee you this many people. It's the same business strategy that James is warning about. It's the same business strategy. You know, it's like this. In the church world, there's a, there's a start time. We're going to have our church launch. What we've done is we've had, and I won't belabor this too long. Some of you may understand this. Others don't care. But let me say it quickly. We're going to have our launch time. What we're going to do is we're going to have a meeting. We're going to meet for, for two months. We're just going to pray. We're going to seek out this. And then we're going to have our launch date. Then we're going to send all of these flyers. We're going to go out and we're going to use uh, Facebook and Instagram and all these other things. And we're going to let people know. And, and that's basically what he's talking about. It's your start time. Then they'll talk about demographics. They'll say, who do you want to reach? Look in the neighborhood that you're in. Do you want to reach Hispanics? Do you want to reach African Americans, Asians? Do you want to reach a general population? Who do you want to reach? And they'll teach you about demographics. Your message, will it fly? Will it fly with so-and-so? So you have demographics. Because there is a theory in church growth called the theory of heterogeneity. No, homogeneity, homogeneity. And the theory of homogeneity is simply you try and reach people who are like you. So they teach you how to do demographic studies. I get these things all the time. They'll have a, they'll have a timeline. We're going to see you have church growth, uh, and you're going to see this happen over this in the first year. They'll always have a, a timeline. They're going to have a, a business strategy. This is how you're going to go about doing it. These are the things you need to do. I, I see this all the time. And then you have a goal, which is usually souls. Very often it's just bodies that are inside of the pew. And uh, that's what it is. Well, James is speaking to corporate executive types. He's talking to business people. He's saying, listen, you've got these strategies worked out. You, 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 you know you're going to start on a certain t time. You're going to try and reach a certain clientele. Uh, you're going to stay there for a certain length of time. You've got a buy and sell kind of strategy that you're going to work out. And your goal is to make a profit. So is there something wrong with this? Somebody would ask, well, wait a minute, shouldn't we make these kinds of plans? Shouldn't we pursue them? Is it wrong to have research, to, to have strategies and plans and, and a willingness to sacrifice for a goal? Is there something wrong with that? And the answer to that question is, is, is no, there's nothing wrong with that. But for the Christian, it is wrong when you plan without praying. And that's what James is pointing out. Plans and strategies are important for success, obviously. Somebody once said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. But James isn't saying it's wrong to plan. He's saying it is wrong to exclude God from your plans. Because praying first is important because we don't control our own lives. We don't have all the information. And because we do not, we seek God for guidance. Remember Jesus in Matthew 6 verse 8 said, your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. God's aware of things I'm not aware of. So before I go out and start something and do something, and that's what James is pointing out, I need to first speak to him. Prayer is the most important thing. Believers should seek God first as you make, it, as you make your plans. And as we lift our plans to him in prayer, we follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. In Proverbs 16, verse 3, it says, Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts, your plans, will be established. Proverbs 16, verse 9, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Psalm 37, 23, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. And so we lift our plans to God, and that's what he's saying to do. Why? Well, verse 14 answers the question, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. What is your life? It's a vapor. In their planning, no allowance has been made for unforeseen circumstances. These 
Business people believe that they're going to live long enough to see their plan succeed. They think they're going to make it to the city and, and spend a year there. And James is saying there's no guarantee that they're going to live that long. We can't even control what will happen tomorrow, let alone 365 days from now. Proverbs 27.1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. So we don't control the future. We don't know it. God does. We can't take tomorrow for granted. We may not see it. I began learning this lesson. I can tell you when. I'll give you the date. I began learning this lesson February 2nd, 1958. I wasn't even a believer. But I remember that date very well. I wonder if I have anybody here who is from around the Norwalk area. I grew up in Norwalk. I know that I have some who are from the Norwalk area here because every once in a while they come and try and stab me. Um, <laughs> try and rob me. But I grew up in Norwalk in the 50s. I was in my room on Orenday Road right there on the intersection of Orenday Road and Gettysburg Drive. And I was... In my bedroom, my brother was in the bottom bunk. I was in the top. We had bunk beds. And there was an explosion. It was in the evening, an explosion. It shook our house. And I actually rolled and came off the bed. And my mother came running in, and I was on the top bunk. My mother came running in, and she was about to tell, tell me off. For, you know, you're not supposed to be jumping off the bed and this and that, as mamas do. And I was... February 8th, I was seven. And, um, but my dad, and we had some guests over, began to make some noise in the front room, saved my life. And I went into the front room and stood at the door, and I looked in the sky. I'll never forget this, February 2nd, 1958. And I was looking up in the sky, and I saw a ball of fire in the sky. And you could see flames, something on fire falling from the sky. You could see it right above us. What had happened is a military plane, a, a DC-6, had, had an accident. They flew into uh, a patrol plane above the city of Norwalk. And when they hit, it exploded. And as it exploded, things began to fall out of the sky. And my dad and my uncle pulled us back into the house because things were falling all over. And you know what happened? The next day, we walked around our neighborhood. One of the engines from one of the planes had fallen onto a house about three blocks from us, fell right in the front room, an engine, a plane's engine, fell on the house. And thank God, that family was out at the, uh, the drive-in, or else they'd have all been killed. But a woman by the name of Edith Hernandez, she was 23 years old, mama of a couple of kids. Edith heard the sound and went outside and was hit by debris falling from the plane and was killed instantly. And I remember that, that happened just a few blocks from where I lived, just up the street. That happened, and I'll never forget that. It was on, I believe it was Jersey Avenue, right by William W. Orr School, where I went to elementary school. It was just up the street, and it landed. Some part hit this woman. We were all talking about it later on. She was 23 years old, stepped outside, and in an instant was dead. That's when I began to learn, even as a seven-year-old kid, tomorrow is promised to nobody. 23 years old, prom promised to nobody. Nobody has a guarantee for tomorrow. Nobody. I don't want to bum you out, but why not? <laughs> it's just <laughs> true. It's just a fact. That's why we live every day for the Lord in preparation to see him. That's why we do that. You're not promised tomorrow. And James is making that very clear to us. You see, before you make your plans, he's saying, and he's speaking to those who learn to rely on their own uh, 
schemes and plans. He's saying you've got to keep God the center of everything. Just because you're successful now doesn't mean that the dollar will remain strong tomorrow. You have to be aware of these things. Again, every businessman knows that. Today, the stock market may be real high, and you may be getting some dividends. You've got a 19.7% rate on, on, your, on your, uh, your bonds and all, and you're, you're growing. Financing, finances is great. And then tomorrow, the stock market drops, and you lose all of this money within moments. And, and that's what he's saying. You don't have any way to rely on. There's no, so so if, you, if you're relying on your own plan, strategies, and designs, he say, no, you have to take these things first and foremost to the Lord. So he says at verse 14, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Then he asks the question, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Again, I mentioned that I grew up in Norwalk. And again, there's a lot of young people in here wouldn't know this, but Norwalk was dairy when I grew up. It, it was a lot of dairy. It was like Chino. We had early morning mist in it, where I grew up. My dad and his family moved, uh, moved to Norwalk when he was a little boy. They had a little farm, a couple acres that they had. And so my dad decided to remain in Norwalk and, and bought a home in, in Norwalk in 1951. So I grew up in Norwalk. Right across the street from me was, was a field. And just uh, three quarters of a mile away from where I lived was pasture. And so my friends and I, even in junior high school, would, would go to this place by, there was a, a dairy called Reliance Dairy, and we would go and we'd climb on hay bales after purchasing some chocolate milk and, and some uh, pies and things, and we would sit on hay bales and, and, uh, in the field, and that's what we did. I mean, there were fields, and so every morning at certain times, it would be real, a lot of mist, because when you have pastures and all, and when the sun comes up, you know, you'll see the mist that is rising. I grew up watching that. I grew up seeing that. But what James is saying is your, your life is like a vapor. It's a mist. It appears for a little time, vanishes away. It's like picture, look at the field. If you were here in Chino, Ontario, whatever, you'll see the fields. And the field has the morning mist, the morning mist that rises. But when the sun rises, it, it just evaporates and it's gone. Or, or think about it when you go and you take a shower in a winter morning and and you turn on the hot shower, close the door so it warms up that room so you don't have to turn the heater on. And so it's warm in there. But what happens is the, the mirrors begin to cloud over, which makes you look a lot better. But the mirrors begin to cloud over. And so you have to take a blow dryer and dry it or take a, whatever way you go about it. And you dry it off so you can uh, do whatever business you need to do, shave or comb your hair or whatever. Well, we know that, and that's what he's saying. He's saying as, as temporary as that is, as transient as that is, it's just here for a moment, and then it's gone. He's saying, you've got to understand, that's your life. That's, that's your life. You know, when you're, when you're young, when you're a young person growing up, you think time moves slowly. Time moves slowly. I can hardly wait until I'm 13. I can hardly wait till I'm 16. Man, one of these days, I'm going to be 18. Man, I'm 21 now. And then you start holding. I'm 29 and 364 days because you hit 30. And it changes, doesn't it? Your conception of time changes when you're a kid and it's Christmas. You know, you stay up late at night. You just, you're so anxious because there are Christmas presents under the tree. And you don't want to go to sleep. You don't want to go to sleep. You're just wanting tomorrow to come, right? But when you're old and you're laying in bed and the kids come in and start yelling, hey, you get up, and you say, shut up, go to bed. <laughs> it's different, right? Time's different. When you're young, it feels like it just goes so slow. When you're old, man, it's passing by quickly. I can't believe it. Because I, 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 uh, I might as well give away something. I, I was driving here one day, and I was thinking, I'd like to have an illustration for something, some musical, this or that. This is the truth. I never told you this. I'll tell you now. And I was thinking, I ought to, uh, oh, that would be, that would make sense if I shared that. And then, and then I started laughing to myself, because that's not true. Because I was thinking of 
some stupid song by a guy named Tiny Tim. <laughs> that was almost, I don't even know how long ago that guy was out. And I thought, I started laughing. I said, nobody knows who this guy is, Tiny Tim. Tiptoe through the tulips and this and that. Now, those of you who know, you're old. You're old. <laughs> but the young people are like, what is that? See, so, but it's just yesterday. It's just for me, it's just yesterday. Because time is different now. When you're young, man, I can hardly wait. When you get old, you remember back 10 years. 20 years, 30 years, whatever God should bless you to be able to. And so we need to understand that that time in many senses is kind of relative to your own age. And so you need to understand that time really, whether it's 10 years or 100, well, according to Job verse seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 7, remember, O oh God, my life is but a breath. In, in comparison to eternity, our lives are a blip on the screen. Psalm 90, verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off. We fly away. Psalm 90, verse 12 goes on to say, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It just goes by. Teach us to number our days. We want to be wise. So James is reminding us of what Scripture teaches is most important. In Ecclesiastes, in chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, remember him before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. He goes on in verses 13 and 14 in chapter 12 to say, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. James is saying, understand the future. To understand the future is uncertain has benefits. One of the benefits is it helps us to keep our trust in God because we consistently depend on Him, but also it helps us to value the present and each moment that we are blessed with. Those of you who are getting a little older and those of you who are young, if I had any advice to give out of this passage, and I'll do this quickly, I would say this, treasure your moments. Treasure your moments. When you're, when you're young, and you get married, first mistake. No, when you're young, <laughs> and you're getting married, and you have a baby, should God bless you. It can feel sometimes like your life stopped. We used to have fun. We used to be kind of cool. We used to go places, do things. Now I have this little anchor around my ankle, my wife. And then I have the kid, too. No. <laughs> and we can't do anything anymore. We used to be kind of cool and suave. We used to go out and spend a Friday night and do what we want, went to nice restaurants, did what we want, ate what we wanted. And now we can't because we have to buy diapers, we have to buy clothes, and now it's Christmas, and now you have a second and a third and a fourth. And those of you know what, uh, who have that know what I'm talking about. Before you know it, the budget seems to be only on the children and the things that, and, and, and if you buy something for yourself, you feel guilty and all of that. So you might get to the point of saying, you know what, I, I almost resent this. I want to get out. I want to do things. I want to... And it feels like my life is just slipping away from me. Let me tell you something. Those are the moments in life that you'll treasure later on. They are. They're the things that you'll look at. Should God give you a grandchild? You'll look at that grandchild, and you'll think of the baby, the baby's mother or daddy. And you'll look at him, and you'll say, I remember when my baby used to do that. I remember when they learned to crawl. My, my granddaughter, 
Olive right now. Olivia, she's trying to learn to crawl, but what she's doing is instead of going forward, she's pushing herself backwards. You know, it's, it's real trippy to me. You know, and so you sit there, watch her. And she doesn't know how to speak yet, so she, you walk in the room, she'll yell, hey, that's what she does. Hey, orale. No, she'll go, hey. <laughs> that's what she does. It's really funny, you know. A- a- treasure those moments. Treasure them. Because I find myself looking and remembering my, my, my Joseph or my Corinne or my David or my Anna. And I think, oh, where did time go? It went so fast. Treasure your moments. Don't resent those moments. Enjoy them. Treasure them in your heart. Like Mary, when it speaks of her and Jesus, she said she treasured. She, she, she kept these things in her heart, and she pondered them. That's what you do. You look and you remember. And, and then, then they have babies. And then the baby's little bratty. And the, and the kids will look at you and say, you, you put up with me, Dad. And I was like this. And then you say, yeah, because I prayed that God would give you a brat the way you were to me. <laughs> so my prayers have been answered. <laughs> Treasure your moments because your life is a vapor. One of these days, and I don't, again, this is fact. This is truth, not to bum you out. Listen to an older traveler. You'll be sitting in your house one day wondering where all the noise is, where all the life is, where all the things that you used to do, where are they? And you're by yourself, just sitting watching a game, and you're thinking, it would be nice to see the kids. It would be nice to hear them. Or you'll see a picture of them when they were small. You'll look at it, and you'll go, where did the time go? Where did the time go? I remember I used to tell my son, don't use my razor. Because he'd, he'd shave his legs, and I'd say, no. <laughs> I said, that's so gross. Don't do that, son. What is your life? It's but a vapor. You go about trying to make money, making your plans. Oh, I'm going to go to s- such and such a city. I'm going to stay there a year. I'm going to buy. I'm going to sell. I'm going to make a profit. I'm going to, you don't even know what tomorrow brings, so enjoy today. Worrying about tomorrow, Jesus said, today has enough worries to take care of itself. Instead of getting caught up, what are we going to, how are we going to enjoy life, flow with it? Doesn't mean you don't plan. Doesn't mean that you don't make sure you make wise investments. And I'm not saying that. James is not saying that. What he's saying is, don't plan without God, because God can lead you to do things that you wouldn't have even considered. Pray. You see, I got saved one day, and, and after I got saved, I went in the army. I got out of the army. I began to, to uh, go to Bible college, and when I went to Bible college, I began a Bible study at my parents' house, and, and uh, a year later, in 73 and 74, a year later, my brother Frank gets saved, and he needs discipleship. I lived in Norwalk. I'm driving to Ontario. I drive to Ontario for a Bible study. When I drive to the Bible study, my brother begins to invite friends from his work. A young woman comes walking in, Marie, who eventually becomes my wife. So we get married. We move to Norwalk. We actually roll in, roll in Heights for a year. Then we move to Norwalk. I begin to minister, uh, doing Bible studies in my home in Norwalk. And then we eventually move out to, to Claremont. We actually started ministering in Claremont. I buy a house in Ontario. In Ontario, I'm doing Bible studies before you know it. I start a Bible study that that grows into a church that occupies the city of Ontario. And from Ontario in 92, we move over here. These were all things that God had already in store for me. I didn't know that that day when I was in that Jesus uh, Jesus, uh, 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 worship uh, kind of uh, event, that Maranatha music event, I didn't know that God's plans for me was to pastor a church to be here in the city of Ontario, for me, this, or rather Ontario and then Chino, for me, the city of Chino was a place that was the wages of sin. The wages of sin is Chino. <laughs> so the idea of coming here, are you kidding me? I'm an L.A. County guy. Going to San Bernardino County, are you kidding me? What do they have there besides cows and flies? You know, and that's the way we, that's how I thought. And lo and behold, the Lord says, 
No, I have plans for you. What are his plans for you? What are his plans for you? He's got plans for you, designs for you. He's got works for you. But you take your ideas and you pray them through. And that's how this church started. And that's how life is. You don't make plans without consulting him. You have to do it first. And we need to be submitted to the will of the Lord. Now, closing very quickly, he had said in verse 15, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, it is sin. So some of his readers didn't submit to the will of God for their lives. They would thoughtlessly brag about what they were doing, where they were going, how their plans were succeeding, how they were getting rich. So James rebukes this attitude. He speaks of their arrogance. When he says you boast in your arrogance, that speaks of your proud pretension. It speaks of a proud confidence in your own knowledge. He's saying you make your plans. You boast about the success. You see, rich businessmen were proud about their ability to predict the future. So he's saying you glory in your self-sufficient conduct. You brag and you live independently of God, and all such boasting is evil. Why? Because it glorifies man. It disregards God. Therefore, verse 17, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. To do good and not do it is sin. There are sins of commission. There are sins of omission. A sin of commission speaks of breaking a commandment. Thou shalt not lie or steal or swear. You shouldn't be getting drunk. Don't be violent. Don't commit sexual sin. These are called sins of commission. But there is the sin of omission. And this is what James is speaking about. Knowing to do right, but refusing to do what is right. To know what is right and refusing to do what James says is sin. You're resisting what God commands, and in doing so, you're sinning. Obeying God reveals faith and love in him. It results in a deeper walk with him. It's like what Jesus said in John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps him, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and manifest myself to him. So he's saying, do good. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. We're taught to do good. And the good works that we, that we do perform are works that the Lord has, has instructed us through his his word and its spirit has encouraged us to do. I, I, I was listening to the news and uh, this I found interesting that the average person, they were saying on the news, the average person does five good deeds a month. 31 days and they did five good things. Five good deeds a month. At least five. There's actually six. I found a sixth one. And so when asked, what, what do you mean that you're doing good deeds? Well, this is their idea of doing good, good deeds. The number one answer, giving someone directions. A second is holding the, holding the door for someone to walk in. Then you have, if, I have, if I'm in a line and I have uh, you know, a cart full of items and someone has fewer items, I do a good deed by letting them cut in before me. Another one is they help someone cross the street. Then there are those who are donating to a charity while checking out at a register or doing a chore or errand for a family member or a friend. These are good deeds that they're doing, but they say that they do at least six of these in a month. We're to be known by doing good. God has actually ordained that there are good works that we should be walking in, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And so that's the life of a believer. That's what we're supposed to do. I mentioned to you that we had our ladies' Christmas bazaar. I didn't mention to you that we had we had uh, over a hundred people here uh, serving, serving. We we couldn't do the things that we do here in this church if we didn't have people who are willing to come on a Saturday when it's raining, and to do all the work that was necessary for our women to be able to come and friends to be blessed. See, that's doing good. The children's ministry, the ushers the people in the parking lots, the people in the worship teams, the people who teach uh, home studies. There's so many. Those are called good works. And so he's saying to us, he's saying that 
If you know to do good and you don't do it, it's a sin, a sin of omission. So we'll close with the idea of this. What is it that the Lord tells us? He talks to me. I'm sure he talks to you. What is he saying? I want you to do this. And you're saying, no, somebody else can. What is it? Because you know he is. Every believer, if you're walking in the spirit, the Lord is speaking to your heart to do things. And he's saying, when you know to do good and you don't do it, it's a sin. That's called a sin of omission. So I'm not trying to lay a heavy trip on you because I do believe that God is laying in the heart of somebody here to give me a Ferrari, but no. No, I'm just <laughs> I'm playing with you. Corvette. But um, <laughs> no, what is he laying on your heart to do? And do it. Watch what God will do. He wants to meet you in a special way. In John 14, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and manifest myself to him. You want to experience God? Obey him. When he says to you, do this, do it. You will be amazed at how God shows up. And you just go, wow. If I hadn't have done that, I would not have seen this. And I can tell you, and I say that because it's true. My life is that, where I try to obey and he shows up. And that's how my faith over these years has continued. This month, I celebrate 49 years of walking with Jesus Christ. And over 49 years, he shows up. He always shows up and always on time. And for me, I simply have to learn to hear his voice and to act. Because if you know to do good, what is it the Lord is saying to you that you know you should do and you're not doing? You know to do good and you don't do it, it's sin. So what do we do? Lord, I'm going to do what you say because I don't want to be in sin. I want to be walking closely to you.